Welcome to Modern Latin America in 15 minutes. My name is Dr. Kim Richardson and today we are going to discuss in super fast fashion Texas and the Mexican-American War. Keep in mind, based on the last or the previous lecture, the liberals were in power in the 1820s in much of Latin America, but in the 1830s the conservatives largely came to power. This is a case in Mexico. When the liberals are in power, that means they have a strong state government and a weak central government. When the conservatives are in power, they have strong central government, weak state governments. And that means that the central government's laws are going to have to be enforced. In the case of Mexico, there's a part way up north, which is Texas. And in Texas, uh, the government allowed uh, Anglo-Americans to come in and settle there, but they had to obey Mexican law, including the law saying that you cannot have slaves, because slavery was eventually abolished. Well, they did not obey that law, but it was not such a big deal because it's a federalist system. But when Santa Ana institutes a centralist system, the conservative government with the conservative constitution of 1836, the Texans rebel. They want to overthrow the centralist government and reinstitute a liberal government. Uh, General Santa Ana sent his troops north to defeat this incipient uprising. And when this happens, they uh, combine their beginning forces, just their initial forces, so not combined. They put their initial forces in a place called San Antonio de Ver, which has a church in it called the Alamo. And in the Alamo is where Santa Ana is going to lead his forces and destroy every last defender of the Alamo. David Crockett, Jim Bowie, William Barrett Travis, and many, many others. In fact, somewhere between 180 to 250 men in 1836, marking the beginning of this independence movement. It now goes from an uprising to independence. The second major battle is at Goliad. That too is going to lead to the destruction of all of the defenders of that uh, town slash fort here in this presidio, which means a fort, right? And in this then, the war for independence begins. The Alamo is the first major battle. The Goliad is the second major battle, and that's going to be followed up by a defeat of Santa Ana's forces by the Texans in April of 1836, ending this Texas War for Independence. General Santa Ana is going to be forced to surrender at the Treaty of Velasco, 1836, granting independence to Texas, although he's going to retract that as soon as he gets back to Mexico City. That was not supposed to be there. Here, therefore, Texas is its independent state, a lone star state, its own country from 1836 to 1846. The United States immediately recognizes independence, yet we say we are not going to adopt Texas or let Texas become part of the United States because of the issue of slavery. We don't want to have uh, uh, too many slave states versus free states represented in Congress. So Texas does not become part of the United States immediately. In 1836, however, based on this idea, another war occurs in which the French invade Mexico to try to force the Mexicans to pay back uh, some damages, real or made up, uh, called uh, the Pastry War of 1838. And that's important. It's important because the French said that the Mexicans owed them $600,000 because of some damage to French property involving a pastry shop, obviously, the pastry war. Uh, in this, they refused to do it initially, but uh, later they agreed. They said, fine, we will go ahead and pay their $600,000. But the French said, well, we've been blockading Veracruz, so now the amount is going to be more than six hundred. dollars it's going to be 800000 General Santa Ana, once again, tried to recoup his uh, chagrined face, I guess. He marches to the coast to defeat uh, the French, he doesn't defeat them, but he proves to the French that it's going to be costly for this war. And this, he, his uh, leg, his horse is shot and crushes his leg, and so uh, he has a wooden leg for the rest of his life. Uh, but he comes back a hero, having redeemed himself from the loss of Texas. General Santa Ana then uh, is going to uh, come back a hero, but he's going to face something else, and that is manifest destiny. The United States at this point, uh, we got Texas so far, we got uh, the pastry war. The United States at this point realizes that uh, uh, we want to spread from sea to shining sea. 
And so that's going to be called, as it's published in the newspaper, Manifest Destiny. We say, we are the nation of many nations, manifest to, man manifest to mankind the excellence of divine principles. Its floor shall be a hemisphere. Its firmament, its roof, the firmament of the star-studded heavens. We must honor to fulfill our mission, our high destiny. So this is the manifest destiny, which says that it is our God-given right to spread Protestant-style Christianity and American-style democracy from sea to shining sea. And with this idea of manifest destiny, James K. Polk runs for president and is elected on the platform of expansion. He's going to go from sea to shining sea because it's our manifest destiny. The first thing he does, therefore, is annex Texas as part of the United States. Now this is important because Mexico says, well, hold on a second, Texas is part of the United States. I mean, it's part of the United States of Mexico. Texas is part of Mexico. And the United States now say, no, we just annexed Texas, an independent country, as part of the United States. So that's where the uh, beginning of this is going to start to play out of what's going to be the Mexican-American War. Now, Texas and Mexico, they say, well, listen, the, it, Mexico says, even if Mexico was independent, the boundary of Texas, did I say that right? Even though, even if Texas was independent, the boundary of Texas is going to be at the Nueces River right here. So all of this territory is part of Mexico. And Texans, and therefore the United States, now say, no, 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 no. The boundary of Texas is going to be uh, right here at the Rio Grande River. So this whole area here is disputed between the two. So the United States sends troops to cross this border into the disputed territory, saying that they're still in American territory. Mexico sends troops to cross this disputed territory, saying they're still part of, part of Mexico. And somebody shoots somebody and somebody dies. This begins the Mexican-American War. This war, as President James K. Polk states, in his war message, we have tried every effort at reconciliation. The cup of forbearance had been exhausted even before the recent information from the frontier of the Del Norte. But now, after reiterated menaces, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States, has invaded our territory, and shed American blood on American soil. She has proclaimed that hostilities exist and that the two nations are now at war. Here was a flag captured, which is now in the James K. Polk Museum in uh, North Carolina. He states right here, a skirmish, and this is at the museum, between American and Mexican troops on the disputed border of the new states of, of Texas led to the war in May 1846. And here is the next part. The Mexican people fought bravely, true, but American armies under... General Zachary Taylor, who will now become president after this. Winfield Scott, who is very important historically. Uh, and he does run for president, but doesn't make it. Both sides suffered high casualties. U.S. troops captured Mexico City in late 1847, ending major resistance. So, this is a very popular war because, number one, it, uh, the United States is going to win this war. Number two is a very popular war because it's all fought on, the, on Mexican soil. Whenever a war is fought on somebody else's soil, so somebody else can see the ravages of war, then the side that does not see the ravages can say, well, this is a good war, it's, this is fun. And number three, it was short. It was short. No matter how good a war is, the longer it goes on, the more people start to dislike the war. So, what you're trying to get so far is the fact that the United States goes to war against Mexico over the annexation of Texas. The first shot is over the uh, disputed territory, which led to war, but both sides were looking for war, and it is going to be victorious for the United States. One of the most important battles is this battle here at Chapultepec, which used to be this, uh, is now it's a historical monument, but it used to be this a cadet academy in which uh, General Winfield Scott is marching towards Mexico City and the cadets surround, uh, try to hold off Winfield Scott at this Chapultepec Academy right at Mexico City. They fail. And according to legend, 
uh, one or more, depending on which story you read, of the boys are going to wrap themselves in the Mexican flag, and rather than surrender to General Winfield Scott, they're going to jump to their death. This is a national uh, uh, day of remembrance in Mexico. The boy heroes, Los Niños Heroes, in which they give their life to defend the fatherland, right? Here is a great image over a hundred years later of President Truman at this national monument. So, here we go. The border of the United States is then going to be the Rio Grande. That's how it was decided as a result of this war. The war is going to end with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo not only gives Mexican $15 million, Mexico $15 million, but designs this as the border. It's going to be a little bit problematic uh, 120 years later uh, with uh, under JFK because the Rio Grande is going to move a little bit, but up to this point it's important. We take half of Mexico. We wanted to, some people in Congress wanted to take all of Mexico. Other people wanted to take half of Mexico. We took half of Mexico, the northern half up here, because this territory had the least amount of Native Americans. And at this point, we are vocally racist, so that means that we, every, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, or at least an assimilated Indian, but at this point back here, we don't want non-whites as much as possible. So we don't take this territory here down south. All right, this does create something that you should know called Yankee phobia. It is this hatred of the United States f created in Latin America as a result of the Mexican-American War. Uh, but it goes on beyond that. It's much more than this. You hate the United States. But at the same time that you have this hatred for the United States, you do have this idea that you wish you could be more like the United States. Because the United States, as you can see, if you ever go from the United States across the border, tends to have a little bit more disposable income. And so here, they have this hatred for the United States because we took half their land, but this wishing that they could actually be like the United States. And we know what that's like, right? There are people who are super wealthy and we're like, oh, I hate those guys. They're so snooty, but I wish I were as rich as them. It's the same kind of thing. Yankee phobia spreads from Mexico all throughout Latin America. Hatred, but does love of United States and United States things, right? It's more felt than explained, right? This war... And all other wars and violence that has been occurring in Mexico cost a lot of money. If you take this graph right here, from 1839 to 1846, the thing that you should note is that the dark one is expenditures, the light one is income. Expenditures outstrip income. That is not good. President Santa Ana managed to finagle, finagle himself out and then in, then out and then into the government. He got out of the government just in time for the signature, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, then snuck back in the government. And so then, while he's a dictator, the United States approach him. We say, we're trying to build a railroad from El Paso, it was starting in Houston, but El Paso, all the way to Los Angeles. Now, we can do it up here, but if you look at this awesome map right here, you'll notice that it's a very bumpy here, right? This is, is a mountainous territory. So we wanted to do it down through Tucson. So, he sells this territory to the United States. This is going to be the last straw for President Santa Ana, and he's going to be overthrown. Uh, however, this is also the last territory, uh, continental United States territorial acquisition. It doesn't count Alaska. We're going to get Alaska later on, uh, and overseas territories. But right here, from the t contiguous states, we buy this from Mexico. This is the Gadsden Purchase, one of the most important purchases, in addition, of course, to uh, the, the territory that we took from Mexico with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. All right, that is Modern Latin American 15 Minutes, the super, super abbreviated version. Make sure and...